Um, hello, uh, my name is uh, Shai Bannon, and I'm going to talk about Elasticsearch. Uh, this session is actually going to be quite interesting, I think, I hope. Uh, it's the first time that I give this presentation. And it's basically going to go through the process that I went through when I tried to think how to build a distributed, uh, highly scalable, near real-time search engine uh, on top of Lucene. Uh, so we're going to go over all the different ways that you can try and scale a search engine and Lucene in specific. Uh, and then uh, we're going to see how Elasticsearch tries to solve those problems. Elasticsearch has many other features outside, aside from the fact that it's a distributed search engine, but we're going to focus on this talk about the fact that how the distributed aspect works and also the near real-time aspect of it. So let's start. Uh, we'll start with some very uh, basic Lucene concepts, which we will need to know in order to uh, uh, try and understand later on how we can work with Lucene in order to make it distributed. So the first concept is something called a directory. Uh, Lucene, has the, Lucene has this uh, really nice abstraction called uh, directory, uh, which is basically just a file system abstraction. It allows you to read and write files, and it's used by different constructs in Lucene itself, uh, to read and write index files. Another important uh, component in Lucene is the index writer. Uh, index writer is the component that you use in order to add, update, create, or delete documents in the index. Uh, as you do those operations, they are done in memory in order to improve the indexing performance. They can be possibly flushed to disk uh, but uh, they do require an explicit commit if you want to uh, make sure that all those changes are really on disk uh, and the next time you'll open an index writer or your system crash or your machine crashes and you want to open it again, you won't lose any documents. And a commit can be expensive. It has a lot of files to usually flush as well uh, and also does a lot of f-syncs on all the different files. A single, uh, another important uh, notion of an index read, uh, writer is that an index, you can only have one index writer indexing against an index. You can't have several of those. Uh, and an index writer is an expensive thing to create, so you probably want to reuse it as much as possible. <clears throat> another uh, concept in Lucene, this is more into how the index is structured. Uh, are index segments. So each index is composed of a lot of uh, small segments. Basically, each segment by itself is almost a self-sufficient uh, in uh, Lucene index as well. <coughs> um, they are immutable up to the leads. Uh, so once a segment is written, that's it. It's not going to change up to the leads again. Uh, and commit officially adds new segments to the uh, to the uh, index itself, though if internally the index writer decides to do some flushing, then those, some segments might be created as well, but they're not officially in the index. Um, and as segments get created, they need to be kept at bay, uh, so they are being merged continuously by the Lucene process. There's the merge policy, merge schedule, and a lot of other uh, uh, concepts. Because segments are immutable, they are great candidates for caching. Uh, these are, we're building now the building blocks, and then we'll see why it's important later on. But they are great candidates for caching. Uh, you, can do, uh, you can load all the terms and create skip lists and stuff like that. Terms-wise, you can use field cache, something that is heavily used to do sorting and, and custom scoring and stuff like that. Um, and you don't have to reload it every time because segments rarely change. <coughs> The near real-time aspect of Lucene that was added, I think, in Lucene 2.9. Um, so basically, uh, uh, if you want to do search, you construct an index reader. There's also an index searcher, but I'm not that interested into it, uh, into it because that's very a lightweight way to wrap an index reader. Index reader is the, the, the heavyweight uh, element uh, in the Lucene when you search uh, using Lucene. If you want to get a new reader, you, you call index writer get reader. And you get, uh, it allows you to get a refresh reader that sees all the changes that happened up until that point when you added documents to the same writer. 
Um, currently, in the current Lucene version, and probably also in Lucene 4.0, it does require flushing. So it does flushes new segments into this. And this is why this operation is expensive, and you cannot really call it after each index operation. Or you can't really call it uh, f before each search that is being executed. That's why it's the near real-time aspect of it. Usually, you would call it every second or something like that. And uh, most of the search, this is another change that happened, I think, also in Lucene 2.9. Uh, searches are segment-based. So even if you, you might get, uh, get a reader that is composed of a lot of uh, uh, more internal segment reader, as they're called, uh, and search knows about this fact, and when you execute a search, it is executed uh, one reader at, uh, one segment at a time, basically. Okay, um, let's go back a bit. Uh, so my experience with Lucene comes from writing Compass in Java. Uh, I tried to make Lucene more approachable to Java developers, uh, and. Through the life cycle of Compass, I was struggling with trying to make uh, Lucene more distributed. Um, the first aspect that I tried to tackle, and I worked for several years in a distributed data grid company, was, uh, okay, let's take the directory itself and try and make it distributed. Uh, if we can actually uh, have a, basically a distributed file system, uh, and the directory will reflect that, uh, then we can basically possibly scale Lucene itself. Uh, the implementation itself is quite simple. Uh, you simply take files. Large files are broken down into chunks, uh, and they are stored in whatever distributed uh, storage you want to use. I was uh, storing it in, uh, in memory data grid to get uh, the best performance that, that is possible. Uh, it's, in, it's actually implemented already for most uh, Java-based data grids. Uh, in Compass itself, there's in, an implementation for Gigaspaces, Coherence, and Terracotta. And I know that in Finispan, uh, the, the JBoss one also has an implementation for a distributed directory. So this is, in general, how it works. You have your index writer ro uh, working on top of a directory, and index reader also works on top of a directory. Uh, and that directory is basically a facade on top of um, several nodes that stores pieces of the, uh, of the files themselves. This is a very poor solution <laughs> to the problem, as I, as I found out. You know, you can't, you can't find things out until you try them. Uh, so this is a very, very chatty solution. Even with uh, advanced concepts like local caching uh, on data grids and stuff like that, you still have to make a lot of network calls, mainly because the the length between the idea of a, a chunked file and the index itself, how Lucene is built, is too far apart. That makes it basically impractical uh, when you really try to uh, run large-scale uh, search operations or indices. Also, uh, big indices still suffer from the fact that you don't distribute the index reader. Index reader is quite a heavy object, and the bigger the, the index itself is with the more the more terms that you have in the index, it means that that is going to use much more memory. Um, and of course, you still have the problem of a single index writer that can index into your index. Uh, and you're basically, you won't be able to scale your, your indexing uh, capabilities. OK, so once that doesn't really work, let's try and uh, go uh, another step and do partitioning, but in another level. So when you try to attack a problem like partitioning with search engine, there are basically two ways to do that. One of those is doing document partitioning. Document partitioning is quite simple. Each document exists on a shard, basically. And each shard has a subset of the, of the total documents that exist in the index itself. Uh, a shard by itself is a fully functional index. It just has 10% of the documents that you have in your distributed index. Another option to try and partition a search engine is doing term-based partitioning. If you, if you know, uh, an index, uh, a Lucene or any implementation of a search engine is an inverted index. It basically has the terms, the actual uh, tokens that are broken down when you do the analysis process in order to uh, index a, a, a piece of text. Uh, 
uh, and the posting list. Where do they exist? In which documents did they exist? Possibly which location within the document and other metadata associated with those locations. So what we can do is we can say, okay, term for, I don't know, Obama goes to shard one. A term for another, another word will go to shard two. So each shard actually has a subset of the terms, but for all the documents. So that term will have all the information of where that term existed in all the documents in the index. That's basically the two most common way to try and distribute a search engine. Let's start with term-based partitioning. So what are the benefits of doing something like term-based partitioning? If we have a k-term query, if you insert like five words, you only have to do, you only need to do, uh, you only need to do at most five shards, right? Uh, if, if those terms exist in the same shard, you only need to go to a single shard, even if you have a 50 shard index. Another pro is that you only, only need to do k disk six in order to uh, satisfy the, usually it depends how it's implemented internally, but in the optimized manner, you only need to do k d6 for a k term query. What are the problems with, uh, with term based partitioning? It has a very high network traffic. So think about it. If you have a complex query that you want to execute, you have to somehow merge all the results that you're coming from all the different posting lists, all the information about that term, or where it, ex it, it exists in, on each document, and somehow transfer that to a single node that will do the merging itself. And of course, for a term like Obama during the presidency rush, that will be crazy. Uh, another uh, very uh, problematic downside that it has is that it's very hard to have per doc information. And what do I mean by per doc information? Think about Google PageRank, right? So that's another piece of data that controls the scoring of the document, but it's very hard for me to uh, try and, and associate those values per document because I've partitioned my data in a different manner. Um, when you go to Lucene, then it goes to, to trying to do things like faceting, sorting, or custom scoring. That's very, very hard to do, up to impossible, basically. Who, uh, which systems implement uh, term-based partitioning? Um, RIAC Search, I know that they do term-based partitioning. Um, it utilizes the internal key value pair distribution, uh, distributed key value pair that they have internally in the storage, as the storage engine. <coughs> and Lucandra, which was abandoned and replaced by Solandra, and we can talk a bit about it later. Uh, and basically what they did was a really cool idea, uh, which I did also implement on top of Gigaspaces, but I never open sourced it because it didn't make sense, and I'll explain a bit why. Uh, so it's basically doing a custom index reader and a custom index writer to work directly on top of Cassandra. It still does a way of term-based partitioning, but it uses, utilizes Lucene to do the analysis process and everything. You just replace the index reader and index writer to work directly on top of Cassandra. <clears throat> what are the problems with that? Again, the same problem that you get with term-based partitioning system. It's very, very, very chatty. Um, up to a point where it's really not usable, especially when you do uh, queries that m expand to a lot of terms, like fuzzy-based queries or, or prefix-based queries. Um, another major, major problem, and that's more related to uh, Lucene, but also to what we talked about before about uh, per doc values, uh, is that it's not inherently, it cannot work inherently with things like field cache, because the index reader is basically always changing then the field, something like field cache, which is very, very heavy to initialize, it's going to take a long time. Uh, you'll have to basically refresh it every search. So people have been trying to use things like Lucandra and HBase in that uh, same, similar implementation on top of HBase, but they suddenly saw very bad performance when they try to do custom scoring or when they try to do uh, sorting or stuff like that. Uh, just a quick note, because I'm not too familiar with it, but Solandra basically tries to take a different approach and try to solve the problem. At the end of the day, though, they still use the same custom index writer and custom index reader, but more locally to the, to the Cassandra nodes or something like that. Um, based on my brief overview of that, they still suffer from the same BIDOC values, so the same constructs like field cache and stuff like that, and the, the fact that uh, you have to refresh it. Uh, much more. Uh, basically, the main problem with that is that the whole notion of segments is lost when you do that. 
And the notion of segments is inherent to a lot of constructs in Lucene. <coughs> okay, so what is the next option? Uh, we'll do document-based partitioning. What are the, uh, the good points about it? Uh, each shard basically can process queries independently. Uh, it is on a subset of the documents, but it can work on its own. <coughs> Another benefit is the fact that it's very easy to add per doc information. Uh, things like page ranks, custom, uh, uh, which leads to custom scoring, sorting, or faceting even. <coughs> Another benefit is that it has very low network uh, traffic. You go and do the search, and you can basically end up with just doc IDs and scoring information, and that's it. And you do the merging on the node that did the distributed search, uh, and you're done. Um, what are the downside of doing document-based partitioning? Basically, the query has to be processed on all shards. So it doesn't matter really which query you, you execute. You still need to execute it on all shards if you want to get good results. And it does k times n d6 if k are the number of terms that you do and n are the number of shards. Uh, basically, most of the search engine and the big companies that implement search engine and you know who they are, they go with document-based partitioning. Uh, that's the most common solution that there is. Uh, it's much more performant. Network is usually the, the, the resource that is suffer most when you try to build a distributed system. So you try to minimize that as much as possible. <clears throat> and a lot of time doing uh, searches is really, really fast up to a degree where it doesn't really matter that I executed on many shards. Of course, you need to think about it in advance when you build your system, but we'll get to that. Okay, so we decide, or I decided, <laughs> that we'll do a distributed Lucene, but we'll do document-based partitioning. Uh, so let's see what we need to do in order to implement that. So we'll basically say we have several shards, uh, and each shard is a complete Lucene index by itself. When we index a document, we decide somehow which shard it's going to uh, end up at. And we do a search, we do a distributed search. We go and search on all the different shards, we get the results, we reduce the results, uh, we do another phase basically of sorting, and return back the results to the user. <coughs> another aspect of a distributed system is replication. And we usually do rep uh, uh, we usually implement replication to get two main benefits. The first one is high availability. Uh, if one node fails, the other node can pick up from where that node failed. Um, if one node holding one shard and another replica, then we have uh, basically a, a, a backup of the data. And another one is that we can easily scale search by having more replicas. There's no really, there's no really a reason to not allow replicas to serve search. So by, ju by just adding slave nodes or replicas, we can increase our, our search throughput. Let's see how we can implement uh, replication. So one option, which was one of the common ones uh, that was used, uh, Solar, for example, uses it, is pool replication. Pool replication is basically a master-slave configuration, and it works uh, by knowing how Lucene works when it comes to creating segment files. So we have a master and a slave. We index documents into the master. When we commit the data, new segments are created, and then the, the slaves can pull those new segments into, uh, into their own machines and refresh whatever needs to be refreshed in Lucene, like the index reader, uh, and then they can serve search requests with, the, with that new data. <clears throat> what, is, uh, what are the downsides of using uh, something like pool replication? First of all, it requires a commit on the master to make those segments visible. So the, sh the slave can basically pull those new segments. And if you remember, we talked about it before, commit is a very expensive operation. You want to do as little commits as you can when it comes to working with Lucene. It has redundant data transfer. So remember, network is a rare resource in a distributed system. If you're running on EC2, it's even more rarer. Um, 
and you end up a lot of times moving more data than you would have wanted to. For example, if you have two segments and you move them around and you have store field and whatever, and that slave has that data, and now Lucene has decided to merge those two segments together. You'll, and now you'll basically need to transfer that segment, that merge segment, again to the slave, because that's a new segment, but you're basically transferring al uh, almost the same amount of data uh, again to that slave. As I said before, there's a, a, a very intrinsic friction between co committing, which is a heavy operation in Lucene, and replication. Uh, and then you start to get to a situation where, where basically the slaves are really, really behind the master. Uh, some reason that that can happen is that you just decide not to commit every time because it doesn't make sense performance-wise, or simply because uh, a large segment has been created and it just takes time to transfer that data to the slave. This basically means that we lose a lot of the high availability notion of a slave. We cannot really treat it as a real-time high availability slave. Uh, just only when it managed to copy over the relevant segment, only then it has that data there. <clears throat> and of course, it won't really work for real-time search. Slaves are way behind the fact that something changed. They need to transfer segments in order to identify the fact that really something changed. And if, by, if again, if a large segment has been merged, it's going to take time to transfer it. And you might, you know, you, you, there's no way that you can get to something like one second uh, refresh rate uh, to get one second visibility, basically, in the scene. Okay, so those are the downsides. What is the other way to do that, to implement it? Another way to do it is to do push replication. Push replication basically works quite simply. Uh, it's quite difficult to implement, but it, the idea is simple. Uh, you index a document into a shard, and that shard will replicate that document into all the other shard. Those other shards will index that document as well. What are the downsides of push replication? You index the same document several times. But we transfer much less data when it comes to doing the replication itself. Uh, and Lucene is crazy fast when it comes to indexing. There's also a very delicate control when it comes to concurrent indexing. If you think about it, uh, things can get interleaved even for the same document, uh, heavy update rates for the same document, and you need to make sure that things are applied in the correct order uh, or using versioning to reject older versions when you try to perform the operation between the primary shard and the replica shards, basically. <clears throat> So that's, that does require a lot of uh, very delicate uh, coding and, and notions where we really don't have that problem with pull replication. We just pull new segments and Lucene was, you know, Lucene is the one that worried about uh, handling concurrent updates. What are the benefits of doing push replication? We talked about it about a bit. So documents are indexed and are immediately available on all the replicas. What does it mean? It means that we have real-time high availability. Once we index the document and we have sync replication, the indexing uh, of a document waits for all the replicas to acknowledge the fact that they have indexed the document in as well. We have complete high availability. And it also allows us, us to build a near real-time search architecture more easily. The documents are there. We can just refresh the, the, the reader, and that's it. And we'll have, new way, uh, and we'll have that data. It's also an interesting architecture when it comes to switching roles. <clears throat> when it comes to a situation where the primary dies, because we make sure that the primary and the replica are on the same page, basically, we can do a quick switch and say, OK, the primary died, the replica is now the primary. And all indexing will go to that primary. So we don't need to, we, 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 we don't need to worry about things like, uh, oh, the master has died and the slave is behind. What do we do? Do we try to replace something into the master? How do we make the slave a master and stuff like that? Things can happen basically by the system itself. They can manage it. <clears throat> Another interesting bit that I want to talk about, so index writer commit is, you know, it's one of my favorite methods in Lucene. <laughs> I just try to work around it. <laughs> Um, so it's heavy, as we said. 
but it is required when you want to make sure that data is actually persisted, which coming from a background of distributed system is really annoying for me that if I index a document, it's not going to be there until I, I call a heavy operation like commit. So this can be solved by having something like a write-ahead log or a transaction log that records the fact that operation has happened on, those, on that index. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so we, uh, it can uh, more naturally be supported in something like push replication because we can have that transaction log and all the different shards. Elasticsearch, and I'm going to start running through it. So it's, it's going to be much simpler now. Um, I hope that once we have the basis going. So how does Elasticsearch work? This is a very simple scenario. We have two nodes running, and we send a curl request to create an index. I don't see that much. So we basically say, create an index called test. Uh, we want to have two shards and one replica. And what happens? Elasticsearch automatically. Elasticsearch is basically th that node, right? It's r running on two machines, or you can just download it and run it twice on your machine. Uh, what it's going to do is going to automatically assign shards. And shards uh, are either a primary or a replica shard. So in this case, we have two shards, shard 0 and shard 1. Uh, and we have a primary and a replica for each shard. Uh, and this is done automatically. All, all this allocation, uh, deciding where to place shards and all this stuff is done automatically by the cluster itself, as it should be. Things should be simple in this, in this manner. <clears throat> How does uh, indexing work? So because it, it does automatic sharding. Basically, it takes a document based on the ID. It will choose the relevant shard that it needs to index to, and it will do push replication directly to the replica. This is an example of how you index a document using curl. You just say which index, which type, which we can talk about it a bit later, the ID of the document, in our case, one. Uh, and this is a JSON document. It can have nested objects and everything. Uh, and it just goes to the, for example, we decided to hit the first node. Uh, it says, OK, document number one will go to shard zero. So it will go to the primary one, because the primary is the funnel that then decides where, uh, which, uh, where to replicate to. It is being indexed on the primary and then replicated to the replicas. But the nice thing about it is that you don't really need to know which node to hit in order to index data. You don't really care about it. Now I'm indexing document number two, but document number two actually hashes into shard number one. But shard number one primary exists on the other node. So Elasticsearch will automatically reroute the request and move it to the other node, perform the operation on, the, on that shard. That node will do the replication, and things will return. So you're completely abstracted from how internally shards are allocated and where they exist as a user. How is search implemented? Search is implemented using a simple scatter gather. So when you execute a search, you hit, again, one of the nodes. It knows where the shards exist. It will go and execute that search on the different shards. Uh, in our case, we need to hit shard 0 and shard 1. If we execute another search, it will run Robin through the replicas. So in this case, we, it will now go to a different set of replicas. Uh, of shards, sorry. <clears throat> and if there's a failure, it will automatically retry another shard. That's not a problem. It knows where the shard exists. It can do automatic retries if there are failures uh, when it comes to ser search. <clears throat> what happens if we want to add another node to such a cluster? So Elasticsearch can ask, actually uh, do hot relocation to shards to the new node. So if we add a new node to the cluster, Elasticsearch will go ahead and say, oh, OK, we have a new node. Let's try and rebalance the number of shards. And it will simply move shards around to create an evenly balanced capacity of the nodes themselves. So it will move, in this case, for example, the shard 0 from the second node to the third node to create an evenly balanced number of shards in the cluster. This is a hot uh, relocation. You can still index data. You can still search. There is a very small period of time where things are blocking just to basically make the switch. Uh, but during, up until that time, the, the relocation is completely transparent. And you can continue index da indexing data into, um, into Elasticsearch. 
what happens when a node failed? So we have this case. So we added a node, and uh, um, balancing has happened. <coughs> so the first thing that happened, if, if you can see, the, the node on the left side just died. The first thing that happened is that Elasticsearch will identify the fact that there is now a shard that zero that was replica, and it will automatically make it a primary. Uh, why do we want to do it as fast as possible? We want to allow, uh, we want to allow indexing to still happen. So as we said, when we do push replication, we can do those tricks. Uh, and this is what happens. But it would go a step further and we say, OK, now I don't have all the shards allocated. So it will go ahead and allocate the rest of the shards on those two nodes. And do recovery and all this stuff and everything without interfering with the indexing or searching oper search operations. It, we can go even a step further and say, OK, um, I have two nodes. And this is a case where, where I have a, a, an index with a single shard and a single replica. <coughs> and I add a node to the cluster. I can actually change the number of replica in, run, in real time. And it will simply add another replica to that uh, index, and it will make use of that new node. So I just expanded my search capabilities and high availability as well as a side effect. A um, few, no, few more things. It has complete multi-tenancy when it comes to indices. So if you think about it, uh, if I create an index called test1, which has one shard and one, in, uh, and one replica, that's great. Those shards have been created, test1 S0 and test1 uh, S0 replica. But I can then go ahead and create a second index, test2. And this time, it will have two shards and one replica. And it will automatically allocate and do the balancing in order to accommodate this new index. And what, what can I do with those indices? I can search on test one if I want. I can search on several indices. I can search on test one and test two. Or I can search across all indices in the cluster. That's not a problem. When we're searching, we're searching on shards. It doesn't really matter if they come from index one or index 10. And this can be greatly simplified by using aliases, saying something like, I have an alias that automatically maps to five indices. So I just search that alias, and that will automatically get translated to a search across those indices. Uh, this can be a great solution for something like log, uh, indexing log, uh, log information, where I can create an index per week. Uh, and, I can, and that index can have completely new behavioral. It can have different number of shards. Uh, and different number of replicas and stuff like that. And the main benefit for something like that is that indexing a document is like this. It happens immediately. We just delete files. This is very different than deleting documents from within an index because of the way Lucene works with the fact that when you delete a document, it just gets marked as deleted. And it only gets expunged when things get merged, when segments get merged out. So deleting the, if I want to keep a 20 weeks history of logs, then once I hit that limit, I can easily delete the, the 21st uh, week. And it won't cost me anything when it comes to uh, you know, performance problems or something like that. <coughs> um, one important note, uh, a lot of those features are actually enabled by, by uh, something called the transaction log, which is implemented in Elasticsearch. Uh, which we talked a bit, uh, the write ahead log basically in the push replication. So when you index or delete a document in Elasticsearch, it's fully persistent. There's no need to call index writer commit. It has a write ahead log, uh, and if something crashes, then that log can be easily replayed when needed. That transaction log is used for a lot of different other stuff, like doing hot re relocation and stuff like that. Uh, and it is periodically flushed, so we don't want to get to a transaction log that holds 100,000 documents, because if we'll do a restart, we have to replay 100,000 documents. So periodically it gets flushed, and you can control that, of course. <clears throat> uh, this is, by the way, you can, you can use Elasticsearch as a single node quite easily, single server, uh, and it it's fully persistent. It survived kill-9. We can f-sync the transaction log on every change. No need to be distributed. Just a highly available single server. And when you want to scale out, it's quite easy to scale out as well. But even in the single node uh, situation, it already brings a lot of things to the table. 
Just uh, some bits of many more features, but again, I'm only focusing on the distributed aspects. I'm not talking about facets and stuff like that. So you can have custom routing values when indexing and searching. So you can say that all the, all the documents that are associated with a specific user will go to a single shard. Uh, and then when I search for that user, I can, bring, uh, I can give that routing value, and then I only need to in, uh, search on one shard. I don't need to search across all shards in order to find information related to that user. So this is custom routing values. Uh, it can have different search execution types, basically. Uh, it can do query, then fetch. So it stores the actual document as well in Lucene. You can disable that, but that's a big performance boost when you do that. Uh, so you can, first of all, query all the nodes, get back the doc IDs and scores, and then only go to the relevant nodes to fetch the documents. So if you have 100 shards, you won't have to fetch 10 documents from each shard. Uh, and with all, all the data, you just fetch the, the document IDs and the score, and then go to the pinpoint the relevant shards and fetch the relevant data. You can do query and fetch, and then it will simply go ahead and fetch uh, from each shard 10, 10 documents and do the reshuffling and return the data to you. It has another feature where you can do distributed frequencies, uh, where it will have another phase before where it would go and compute the distributed frequencies across all the shards and then execute the search with those distributed frequencies information. And internally, which is very important when writing a distributed system, it's completely non-blocking when it comes to doing network. It's based on invented IO uh, communication, which means that there's no blocking threads on, when doing socket uh, calls. There's no deadlock because of, deadlocks because of that. And it's very scalable when it comes to having large number of shards or executing a distributed search over a large number of shards or even indexing into an index with 20 replicas. A shard with 20 replicas. Thank you very much. I'm Shai Bannon. That's my Twitter. Elasticsearch, quite easy to find. Uh, that's it. Any questions? Hi. Um, Hi. I'm just wondering how the hot failover works. Do you use push for that? Do you replay the transaction log or? Yeah, so, so you mean the hot relocation? Yeah, or, sorry. Yeah. So basically what happens is that when a relocation happens, it gets marked uh, in, in Lucene itself by making sure that we don't delete the segment files of Lucene and we start to transfer the segment files and we disable flushing. We don't call commit anymore on Lucene and we only store the changes in the transaction log. And once that phase has, is done, basically we copied over all the, all the index files, we start replaying the transaction log into the replica, and then we do the switch and we tell it, okay, there's a new one. Uh, since this is quite similar to uh, Solar. No, uh, it's not. Okay, since it's based on the same <laughs> technology. No, uh, no, no. Since it's both based on Lucene. After this presentation, yeah. if that's what you say. No, but. <laughs> um, okay. I got directly to my question instead. Uh, are there any um, performance comparisons done between this and solar with sharding? Um, I'm not familiar with any. Um, no, I don't know. But it's, I have some experience. I've been working with Lucene for 10 years. Uh, so, and I've been doing distributed systems for a few years as well. It's highly optimized. <laughs> um, yeah, I have uh, actually two questions. The first question is because you index uh, the document on each uh, shard, uh, when replicating, have you thought about, especially when the um, tokenization is very hard, uh, to pre-tokenize uh, on one server and then simply um, move uh, the, the serialized token. tokens uh, to each, um, each shard? Yes, yeah. I have, just not implemented yet. Okay. Yeah, and the second question is, uh, which also applies to Solar, in that case, if you... Um, 
if you distribute uh, the search to different charts, um, have you, do you have any solution on the global IDF problem? Yeah, that's the DFS phase. So you okay, can execute yeah. a search. Because I did not understand it. Right, maybe. sorry. Okay. So you can execute a search that will go to all the different charts, will do the query rewrite, uh, extract the terms, get them back to the single shard, with the uh, aggregated document frequencies and then do the search with that information. Yeah, but then you have the same problem like with the multi-searcher and negative queries. Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. you can <laughs> run into the same problems with okay. multi-searcher, yeah. Uh, even though, by the way, and it applies to solar as well, when you have big enough data, usually uh, it basically has been proven that statistically you don't really have that problem. And, you know, Elasticsearch can handle tens of terabytes, has, been proven to handle tens of terabytes of data and billions of documents. Okay, we think, I think we have time for one more question. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> you have to guarantee that um, the primary and the replica are always consistent, at least the versions yes. you're using for search. So I guess you're probably not using the real-time uh, reader, index reader. I do, I do. You do? Yeah, so basically uh, in Elasticsearch by default, periodically, with the, the default value is one second. By default, uh, every one second, you'll get a refresh reader and you'll see the results uh, that have happened during but that time. What happens if, um, if um, the replica might um, not have flushed yet for, for document and, and, the, and the primary has, and then these, these readers uh, would uh, deliver? They might be out of sync, yes. Yeah. They, those readers can be out of sync. You have an option in Elasticsearch to, to specify a preference where you would say, I only want to search on the primary, and that's it. But better yet, Elasticsearch allows you to do preference based on a custom value. And then it will make sure that when you use that custom value, it will always search the same order of, re of replicas in the shards. So in terms of presenting consistent view to the user, you can use the user ID as that value, and you can be promised that it will have a consistent view. So it won't go to different shards if he uh, navigates through the search requests or stuff like that. Okay, thanks. Uh, and there always, there's another advanced feature which allows you to scroll, so you can open a scroll on Elasticsearch, and then it will make sure for that scroll that it won't replace the index reader. And you can use that scroll ID to continue and search, and things won't change while you're searching. Okay, I guess we can, uh, further questions can be discussed offline. Sure, no problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.